Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Robert Wynn, director of the VCU Massey Cancer Center, and I'm here with you today for the health inequities and disparities in COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on cancer care among racial and ethnic minorities and the medically underserved. I'd first like to thank you all for joining us uh, to this very, what we believe, important meeting. I'd also like to thank um, Representative Dolores McQuinn for being with her, us today, uh, as well as our esteemed panel. I have the following conflicts of interest. And so as we think about um, this COVID-19 pandemic, um, it's clear that in the early phase, there was a lot of us getting to know what was happening. In fact, this is a um, the slide that depicts the first known U.S. COVID-19 deaths as actually being earlier than what we had previously thought. Um, this was obviously a time in the early phase of COVID where we were obviously quite confused. Again, just thinking about COVID, there's some basic, uh, anything that, uh, basic strategies that go along with almost any pandemic. One, that to be honest with you, that testing is important, tracing is important, and being able to identify the people with the disease uh, and separating them was obviously keys to survival 101 of any pandemic or any sort of epidemic that would occur. It was clear that um, in those areas that we struggled in testing in the early phase of our COVID-19. We had high hopes for a rapid antigen test that proved to some be somewhat um, not exactly the best possible test, but that's still being worked on. And I think it will be a reliable tool and a useful tool um, as this um, as our testing strategies go on with COVID-19. We also had the need for antibody testing. And as many of you know, and seen in manuscripts and other places, the antibody test was also um, fell unfortunately short. Um, we did have one reliable test, and that was the PCR test, which many of us um, used uh, throughout the entire country. Treatment. As we talked about the triad of, well, how does one deal with the pandemic? It was testing and there's treatment. Again, many of us were really scratching our heads and really trying to get the best um, information we could out about how to treat COVID-19, but many of us fell short. Those early days, I remember uh, reaching for almost anything, and we were very confused until we had several studies that came out. And one was the Gilead um, um, study, which looked at remdesivir and its impact on COVID-19 trials. I think it's important to note that um, as we're looking at COVID-19, we're not looking at a, a disease that's going to be here, an infection that's going to be here for a couple months, but for potentially a couple years. And so this uh, gave us hope because this was our initial foothold in that we had at least a tool of treating patients with COVID-19. The ultimate goal, though, was to develop a vaccine. And as many of you know, Dr. Fauci and others have really uh, put the pedal to the metal in trying to come up with a vaccine as soon as we can. The truth of the matter is that even if we were able to develop a vaccine within 18 months, that would be like an indoor track record. But we have many people, many bright minds all over the globe that are really focused on this. So I'm very hopeful that we'll have a vaccine, which really would be the major tool of com combating COVID-19. But sadly, COVID-19 also revealed for us um, that we had disparities. And for many of us, uh, we're using words like COVID-19 finally put a light on what we've known that has been happening in this country and throughout the world for the better part of more than 100 years. And in fact, there were many articles written about the COVID disparities as pictured here. Even locally in Richmond, um, it was clear that the disparities um, really, uh, whether you were in a large city like New York or in a mid-sized city like Richmond or in a small city like San Antonio didn't matter. In fact, in Richmond, 90% of the deaths in Richmond were um, from African-Americans uh, within our city. When we looked in our state, the state of Virginia also had significantly more African-Americans dying from COVID than white. This really painted a picture that we had a lot of work to do and a lot of road to travel to be able to reduce these disparities. As such, what we really learned from the COVID-19 
was that social determinants of health, these upstream determinants of health, mattered. That social distancing was great, but how would one be able to social distance in a very small area or if you were living in a compact tenement? The truth of the matter is that being able to work from home was fantastic, except we knew that if you had a college degree, you were 80% or more of those folks were able to work from home, whereas less than 30% of those folks with a high school education or coming back from the justice system had the ability to work from home. And so many of these people served as our frontline um, uh, sort of agents, making sure that they were manning our grocery stores and other things like this. These really were our frontline heroes. But part of why they were put in a place to be our frontline heroes was really based on social determinants of health and the fact that education played a role. As a result of that, we sometimes are now wrapped into this thing that this is somehow new and that we should do something about this. Uh, my call to action for this panel and everyone that hears this is that we don't retrench as we've done in the past. We have um, studied the root causes, not only of rioting as shown here by the Watts Rise 1965, but the root causes of disparities, high unemployment, poor schools, inferior living conditions, residential segregation to police discrimination. Does this sound familiar? Not only have we been able to describe these things, but we've come up with multiple ways of addressing these by blue rim panels, such as the Rumford uh, Fair Housing Act, among many, many others. That really, since 1965, we have known how to address this issue. So why are we here? I believe we're here to do two things. We certainly recognize that the zip code or the neighborhood of association and the public health aspects of COVID are real. And our esteemed panel will unpack and address some of this for you uh, as we go through that. But I also wanna paint a picture that the DNA also has to be at least evaluated or at least considered. The impact of various poly, different polymorphisms within the African-American community, whether that played an effect or not, is also something that many um, uh, in the area of understanding the impact of COVID-19 in disparities are also studying. So when we put all these pieces together, what you have is really an understanding of from a public health sort of perspective, from a clinical translational perspective, and from a basic science perspective, the pieces that we have to put together for the puzzle that's called COVID-19 to be able to have um, impact. I think that uh, Mayor uh, Lori Lightfoot from Chicago said it best when she said, stop playing with me. And I think that what we have to do as a group, particularly of um, researchers, clinicians, academicians, is stop playing. We understand that uh, to fight COVID, it requires action and it requires action now. So I'll stop uh, here and tell you that um, one public service announcement, that's my grandmother who's 93, um, who was the one that made sure that, you know, I wore my mask and she wore hers. So be honest with you, let's keep each other healthy. Uh, personal protective gear does matter. Uh, social distancing does matter. And the reality is that I can't wait to hear what this esteemed panel is going to help us think through as we're trying to do our best with understanding COVID-19 so we can have a big impact on COVID-19. So uh, allow me to introduce our first presenter today, Dr. Uh, Lisa Newman. Dr. Newman is a surgical oncologist with a clinical and research practice dedicated to breast cancer management. In August 2018, she was appointed chief of the section of breast surgery at New York Presbyterian and Wild Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Newman uh, leads a multidisciplinary uh, group of breast oncologists there. Uh, but more importantly, she is a true champion of making sure that we are re being able to reduce a health disparity. So the next voice you hear will be that of Dr. Newman. Hello, I'm honored to participate in this AACR session coordinated by the Minorities and Cancer Research Council. However, our focus with this session is a tragic one as we've now added yet another disease to the already lengthy list of conditions for which minority populations such as African Americans and Hispanic Latina Americans are disproportionately affected. Disparities in comorbidities associated with the metabolic syndrome such as obesity, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease are all well documented as contributing to the cancer burden of racial ethnic minorities. 
These associations are multifactorial in etiology, and the magnitude of the disparity varies by type of disease, by population subset, and also by the extent to which individual factors account for the disparity. The effects of systemic racism and socioeconomic disadvantages on access to health care, as well as our delivery of health care, are clearly dominating pervasive factors in this complex picture, but other factors also contributing to varying degrees, such as biology of disease, environmental exposures, germline genetics, and the epigenetic effects of lifetime stressors. The COVID-19 public health crisis has been heartbreaking in its impact on everyone, regardless of racial ethnic identity. But given what we already know about health inequity in the United States, it was inevitable that the African American and Hispanic Latina American communities would suffer disproportionately from the morbidity and mortality of this pandemic. It's furthermore predictable that the very nature of COVID as a communicable disease would compound the complexities of understanding pandemic-related disparities. As shown by the bar graphs on the left of this slide, COVID-19 mortality rates are more than twofold higher in African Americans compared to other subsets of the population, and they are lowest among white Americans. The bar graphs to the right demonstrate this disproportionate COVID mortality burden borne by African Americans, regardless of whether you look at region of the country, such as states in the Midwest versus the East or the West Coast, and regardless of whether you look at states with a larger or a smaller sized African American population. It's worth noting, however, that not all states have made COVID-related race and ethnicity mortality data publicly available, although additional information can be retrieved through the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. This slide demonstrates that New York City was indeed an epicenter for the pandemic in the United States. On March 11, 2020, the first COVID death was reported in New York City, and the disease rapidly exploded over the following month. On April 7th, we reached a peak of 590 COVID-19 deaths in one single day. The city, of course, shut down completely in order to control the surge and flatten the pandemic curve, but it wasn't until June 4th that we finally experienced our first day of a zero COVID-related deaths. In all, 15 to 19% of the country's total COVID mortality burden has occurred in New York City. Taking a deeper dive into the COVID burden of the diverse population of metropolitan New York, we gain additional information regarding COVID disparities. Here we see age-adjusted population-based COVID rates among hospitalized patients, non-hospitalized patients, and those that died in New York City, again demonstrating the highest rates in all three metrics among African Americans. On a national level, COVID burden among Hispanic Latinas was only slightly higher than in white Americans, but in New York City, Hispanic Latinas experienced COVID morbidity and mortality much closer to the rates seen in African Americans. Now, to at least start to understand COVID disparities in New York, it's important to look at the demographics of our city. New York City is comprised of five different boroughs, Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island. And these boroughs have interesting demographic patterns. Brooklyn is the most populous, and if Brooklyn was a separate city, it would actually be the fourth largest city in the United States. Staten Island has the smallest population. Manhattan is the smallest borough by land mass, but by far and away, it's the densest, with approximately 70,000 persons per square mile. In terms of wealth, Staten Island has the highest median household income, followed closely by Manhattan, but Manhattan, and especially neighborhoods like the Upper East Side, is the home to the largest numbers of millionaire and billionaire residents. The Bronx has the lowest median household income, and nearly 30% of its population lives below the poverty level. These various features are linked to COVID burden in conflicting ways as population density will clearly intensify the spread of a contagion, but wealth and better healthcare access can control its impact. The profile of racial ethnic diversity for each of the New York City boroughs also contributes to COVID disparities. 
Staten Island is the least diverse with nearly 80% white American residents, compared to the Bronx, where white Americans are actually a minority, accounting for only 30% of the population. Queens is notable for its relatively large Asian American community. Looking across the five boroughs, we see the end results of these patterns. Manhattan, despite its population density, was the borough with the lowest overall COVID mortality rate, probably reflecting its greater wealth, and Staten Island, having both overall wealth and lower density of its population, also experienced relatively lower COVID death rates. The Bronx, on the other hand, has large populations of hard-hit minority communities and the highest poverty rates, and it therefore had the highest COVID death rates. Within borough, however, as shown by the bar graphs to the right on this slide, we see the persistent impact of race ethnicity, with whites having the lowest COVID death rates in each borough, but whites in the Bronx having higher COVID death rates compared to whites in Manhattan. African Americans and Hispanic Latino Americans, on the other hand, had the highest COVID death rates within each borough compared to other population subsets, but they did a little bit better in the more affluent borough of Manhattan compared to other boroughs. Just to keep things in perspective, however, it's important to note that all New Yorkers were hit substantially harder by COVID compared to the overall United States. And here I've inserted the total country's mortality burden from COVID, and these rates are completely dwarfed by the rates that we see in all of the New York City boroughs and regardless of racial ethnic identity in those different boroughs. Turning now to the breast cancer burden of New York, we also see patterns that reflect the wealth and the race ethnicity of the different boroughs. Breast cancer has an earlier stage distribution and a lower mortality rate in Staten Island. The Bronx has a more advanced stage distribution and a higher mortality rate. Interestingly, Manhattan also has a shift toward earlier stage distribution of breast cancer, but relatively higher mortality rates, which may be explained, at least in part, by the disproportionately high breast cancer mortality rates of African Americans in Manhattan, as shown by the bar graph to the right of this slide. Now, we know several of the reasons why minorities such as African Americans and Hispanic Latinas were hit so hard by COVID in New York City. And many of these reasons are related to sociodemographics and to exposure to viral load. These minority population subsets account disproportionately for our essential workers that kept the city going during the shutdown, such as hospital workers and employees of transportation and public service systems. African Americans and Hispanic Latinas are more likely to share multi-generational homes or to live in housing environments that are less well equipped to comply with social distancing policies. Also importantly, these minority population subsets are more likely to receive their health care in safety net hospitals that are financially and resource constrained. Pre-existing diseases such as diabetes and obesity are more prevalent among minorities, and these are also risk factors for COVID morbidity and severity. As we look to pandemic recovery, we should also be proactive in addressing the likely impact of COVID on cancer disparities, with breast cancer being a prime example of why this is important. During our medical response to managing the COVID health crisis, our mammography screening programs were placed on hiatus, and this will probably have a worse impact on communities such as African Americans that were already more likely to have advanced breast cancer stage distribution. Minorities were more likely than others to lose their jobs and insurance coverage as a consequence of the COVID recession, and this will also impact on breast cancer screening as well as treatment during COVID recovery. The same comorbidities that contributed to COVID morbidity and mortality will also contribute to breast cancer outcome. Our public safety net hospitals have been disproportionately devastated by the financial toll of caring for COVID patients. And these same facilities provide the safety net oncology care to many of our African-American and Hispanic Latino American cancer patients. Lastly, in recent years, 
we've generated exciting research regarding the genetics of African ancestry, and selected components of these genetics probably contribute to differences in, in breast tumor biology between black women and white women. These same ancestral genetics might contribute to COVID inflammatory response. Now, we certainly have not now, we certainly have not conquered cancer disparities, but we have indeed learned quite a bit about addressing them, especially with regard to malignancies associated with the largest magnitude outcome differences, such as breast cancer. I believe that by applying these lessons learned to our pandemic response and recovery, that we can mitigate some of the downstream COVID consequences and prevent one public health crisis from begetting several others. First, oncology clinical trials teams should leverage their resources to ensure accrual of appropriately diverse patient populations onto COVID-19 testing, treatment, and vaccine trials. Some of these resources involve social media and educational outlets. Others will involve manpower resources, such as connections with patient navigator and community-based cancer advocacy organizations. Second, we've learned the importance of a priori embedding research aims into cancer clinical trials that are specifically designed to answer disparities research questions. And it's also essential to address diversity accrual targets into the statistical study design so that results can be generalized with confidence. These same principles should be followed in the design of COVID studies. Over the next few slides, I'll show you an example of how my research team is embedding disparities research lessons that we've learned from breast cancer into our ongoing COVID research. My international research team studies the frequency of triple negative breast cancer in women with diverse ancestry. Women with Western Sub-Saharan ancestral backgrounds, which includes African Americans and Ghanaian women, have relatively high frequencies of triple negative breast cancer compared to women of other ancestries, such as white Americans and East Africans, as represented by Ethiopians. Dr. Melissa Davis, the scientific director for our research program, is an expert in the Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines, commonly referred to as the Duffy gene. The Duffy gene is interesting in disparities research because there's a particular variant of this gene called a Duffy null, which is linked to Western Sub-Saharan African ancestry, and so it's an ancestry informative marker. We found that the inheritance of this germline in Duffy null genetic variant is associated with risk of developing a triple negative breast cancer. The reason why Duffy Null is linked to West African ancestry is because the Duffy Null status confers resistance to selected malaria pathogens. And so it was one of the many variants genetically, such as sickle cell trait and the thalassemias, that was under tremendous evolutionary selection pressure over the millennia to allow generations to survive a disease as deadly as malaria. West Africans brought the Duffy Null variant to the Americas with the slave trade and to other regions of Africa during the Bantu expansion. Well, it turns out that being Duffy Null is also associated with chemokine balance and inflammatory response, and the effects in pulmonary tissue might be influencing the cytokine storm associated with severity of COVID pneumonia. Our group is therefore in the process of studying the role of Duffy in COVID-related research. Because of the COVID shutdown on cancer screening programs, it's essential that minority communities be targeted for aggressive screening efforts as these services return. In the effort to catch up with cancer screening while continuing to adhere to social distancing protections, Many believe that telehealth and mHealth technologies will be the answer. But we must exercise caution here as the digital divide is real. Access to and utilization of internet-based information across different population subsets is not equal. Several studies, including this one from California, 
have shown that African Americans and Hispanic Latina Americans are less likely to utilize telehealth technologies. As mentioned previously, our safety net hospitals, which by definition are financially and resource constrained because they provide medical care to the highest proportions of indigent patients, have been hit the hardest by COVID care. As we return to some semblance of a normal healthcare environment, we need to ensure that these facilities will be supported. Close monitoring of distribution of funds from the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act should therefore pay special attention to these safety net facilities. Lastly, we need to think about restoring health care insurance to the millions that were left unemployed because of the shutdown-induced COVID recession. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that even during the pre-COVID economic boom period, unemployment rates were disparately higher among African Americans and Hispanic Latino Americans compared to whites. Unemployment rates rose more steeply for Blacks and Hispanics during the pandemic. And now very recently, we've been hearing a lot in the news about the United States economy making a comeback with the May 2020 unemployment rates starting to decline. However, the disparities in this financial recovery are stark. While unemployment rates for whites have dropped down to 12.4%, they are 17.6% for Hispanics, and the unemployment rates actually continue to rise for African Americans, now at the level of 16.8%. In the cancer world, we learned that expanded Medicaid associated with the Affordable Care Act was quite successful in improving cancer control programs. As shown here, states that enacted Medicaid expansion saw notable improvements in the stage distribution of their patients with breast, colon, and lung cancer compared to the non-expansion states. And so it's reasonable to assume that comparable measures will assist in the health maintenance of populations financially impacted by COVID. In closing, I hope to see close collaboration between the oncology community and the public health professional communities. As we rebuild healthcare in the post-COVID era, we must be proactive in achieving health equity and mitigating further disparities by working together. Thank you for your time and attention, and please remember to vote on November 3rd. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Uh, the next presenter will be Dr. Ramirez, who is the founder and director of the Institute for Health Promotions Research at University of Texas Health uh, San Antonio. And in 2019, she was named the chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UT San Antonio. Dr. Ramirez has a great deal of experience in developing research and communication models to improve Latino and Latinx health locally and nationally. And honestly, she is just a high impact player and uh, it'll be wonderful to hear her. Uh, the next voice you hear will be that of Dr. Ramirez. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Amelie Ramirez and I'm the director of Salud America, which is a national network uh, for Latino health equity. I'm also professor and chair of population health sciences at UT Health San Antonio and also the associate director for uh, our community outreach and engagement program of the Mays Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Wynn and, and panelists, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, this afternoon and thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd like to address the impact uh, of disparities on COVID-19 in our Hispanic community. Um, we, we know that um, COVID-19 uh, has impacted our community, but it also has worsened existing inequalities that we find among our Latino communities as well as our communities of color. Uh, and we're I'd like to highlight some uh, potential solutions to, uh, for us to move forward and to offer a few tools for systemic change. And the other important thing is that we all need to work together to make sure that we are providing our communities with the 
best information and the most credible information possible. We need to get our communities to believe on the importance of good science. This can help us increase the self-efficacies uh, in, in our communities. Uh, I do not have anything uh, to, to disclose. Currently, the Latino population represents 18% of the U.S. population and is now the majority minority. And we expect that this 18.2% to rise to nearly 25% in the next 15 years. And at this point, the U.S. will no longer be a majority white, but actually a minority white population. Most of you have heard that where you live matters for your health. Even before COVID-19, inequitable city planning, historic discriminatory practices like redlining and other inequalities created racial and ethnic wealth gaps in our neighborhoods. These areas lack health promoting assets like health care and jobs and other opportunities. Latino neighborhoods, for example, struggle with equitable access to healthy foods, safe places for physical activity, affordable housing and transit, social support, and co healthy community school environments. In San Antonio, the Hispanic population is 64%, yet many dis uh, disparities exist by neighborhood. For example, in this slide here, Dinawiti Hill, where there is lots of inequities uh, is compared to a less diverse neighborhood such as the Alamo Heights, which is just a couple of miles down the road. In Din Din Dignity Hill, you'll notice that we have a higher Hispanic concentration of 74%, um, more individuals per household, uh, a higher rate of poverty, a lower income, lower access to um, internet connections or even uh, ability to own a computer. When you contrast this to the Alamo Heights community, you see that life expectancy increases to the age of 80. There are fewer Latinos in this neighborhood, fewer individuals living in the same household, much less poverty rate, but a much higher income and a higher uh, ability of inter individuals to have access to the internet and to be able to own their own computer. The inequities Latinos already faced before COVID were many. Compared to their non-Hispanic white peers, they have higher poverty rates, the highest rates of uninsurance, inequitable access to early education, less stable housing, um, less uh, safe streets, um, no place, safe places to play, food swamps or food deserts, and heavy exposure to pollution and toxins, and exposure to more adverse childhood uh, experiences and, and trauma. When COVID struck, we knew that these inequalities among our Latino communities would be exasperated. So our team immediately applied its digital content curation model to create culturally competent, relevant blogs, peer role model stories and videos, action opportunities, graphics, tweet chats, podcasts to address the pandemic impacts on the U.S. Latinos. Over the 42 days between March the 5th and May the 3rd of 2020, we created 43 in-depth blog posts on Latino health equity and the coronavirus. We created tweet chats, we created podcast episodes and action opportunities and developed bilingual infographics and a landing page with featuring all the content on COVID-19 and Latinos. We have become the go-to source for information about COVID-19 and Latinos. We disseminated all of this content through our multiple channels, our websites, our social media, our email um, lists, our partner network, 
our digi digital health promotion content led to spikes in program website traffic to record highs. Almost 500,000 individuals were following us, revealing the model's effectiveness in increasing exposure to culturally relevant and action-oriented information for this new uh, topic. But more importantly, we uncovered just how the virus was truly impacting our Latino communities. Many states experienced large disparities in COVID cases, including these vast disparities that we see in Utah, Oregon, New Jersey, and Washington, to name a few. For example, where in Utah only 14% of the state's population is Latino, yet they represented 39% of the COVID cases. It's the same for Washington State, where Latinos make up 13% of the state's population, yet 38% of the COVID cases were Latinos. Mortality rates also saw disparities. The CDC shared racial and ethnic data on provi provisional death counts for COVID-19 uh, as, as early as May of the 28th, 2020. We saw that 16.4% of the U.S. COVID cases deaths were among Latinos. However, Latino death rates became a more, um, more outsized to 26.8% when CDC actually used weighted uh, population distributions. The weighted population distributions ensure that the population estimates and percentages of COVID-19 deaths represent comparable geographic areas in order to provide information about their, uh, whether certain racial and ethnic group subgroups were experiencing disproportionate burden of COVID-19 mortality. And so again, here where Latinos represent 18% uh, of the population, yet their overall death rate was 26.8. Uh, and as you can see, for the different uh, states that have large Hispanic populations, in just about each one of these states, we had higher um, deaths in our Latino populations. And what we've seen is the inequities are worsening. Evidence from previous recessions show families of young children with low incomes, communities of color, and immigrants are particularly vulnerable uh, to the economic downturns resulting in the spread of economic hardships over longer periods of time and even after the economy as a whole recovers. This reality, when compounded by pre-existing wealth disparities by race, ethnicity, and gender, have really exasperated the inequality and in increase in hardships in our communities. This slide is just an example of some of the information that our team curated uh, during this time of, um, of concern. Uh, for example, uh, we looked at the, the, uh, the toll that COVID has taken on job loss, on homelessness, on the economy, and issues like domestic violence and child abuse. This slide shows some specific areas in where we're documenting the inequalities. For example, people with health insurance get tested for COVID-19 more frequently than those who don't. And even if these tests are free, 19% of our Latino communities are uninsured. And so the worst coverage rate among, the, and they have the worst coverage rate among our racial and ethnic groups. When we look at jobs on the front line, only 16% of our U.S. Latinos can work from home. They are overrepresented in the high contact jobs, those jobs in where we're food retail, um, hospitality, health, uh, with little or no paid uh, leave. We also saw that 27% of Latinos live in poverty. And COVID-19 has only made it worse, with unemployment rates reaching almost 18%. 
uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, our Latinos are essential workers and members of the multi-generational households uh, are more likely to be exposed to the coronavirus and less likely to be able to experience social distancing. Latinos represent 27% of the population in poverty. And again, the coronavirus just increases these inequities in access to social support, housing, food, and more. And again, as I said, the unemployment rate is even higher among the Latinos at 18.2% compared to the overall 14.7%. Uh, We also saw food insecurity. Amid the coronavirus, families who rely on nutrition and can't stock up on food uh, or, or buy online, 16% of our Latinos suffered food insecurity. And almost 57% of Latinos are housing cost burden, spending about a third of their income on housing. And again, the coronavirus just increased this housing instability and increase in homelessness. When we look at cancer patients who get COVID-19, 13, a 13% 13 risk of dying um, versus 6% death rates for coronavirus in the general population. So that's the cancer patients who had, were stricken with COVID-19 had higher risk of dying compared to the general uh, population. But reasons are, are, uh, are similar for all. Uh, if they happen to be uh, smokers, if they were of older age, or they had underlying conditions, all of this, uh, and, and cancer, all of this posed a greater risk for them. But we also do a lot of work in tobacco and tobacco prevention, and something that we saw here is that smoking contributes to more severe coronavirus, and that secondhand smoke can transfer the virus. Again, about 23 or almost 24 percent of Mexican Americans non-smokers are exposed to secondhand smoke. Another area that we have seen worsening is, is obesity. We know that obesity was one of the most important predictors of severe coronavirus, and our adult Latino population uh, suffer from obesity at about 47 percent, and our children at about 19 percent. Um, and our population um, has the highest obesity rates than any other racial or ethnic group. And then also diabetes. Diabetes puts people at risk of um, death related to the coronavirus. And again, our Latino communities has higher uh, rates of diabetes compared to the U.S. Uh, overall rates. So how can we really uh, address these uh, inequities? Um, we need to work very closely with our communities. We need to build that trust with our communities that, that we honestly care for them and that we want to create change. And these are just a number of steps that have been identified as an important way for us to help um, not only navigate the pandemic, but hopefully come out on the other side of it and truly uh, improve the health uh, inequities that we have been seeing. We need to better understand the need for health equity during the COVID-19. We need to listen to our communities and what can, how can we help best help them, work together with them, not just um, on, um, individually, but we need to work collectively on this issue. We need to increase uh, SNAP benefits by at least 15%. We need to address housing and eviction issues. How can we help individuals who've lost their job to this pandemic uh, maintain their home and get settled and not place them on the streets? How can we add to paid leave policies? How can we expand health care coverage? These are issues that have been with us for a long time, but we need to get up to be have a voice in these issues and to want to create change. We need to better support disadvantaged families. Um, 
we need to protect our struggling health workers to make sure that they have the the right um, so to to better um, inform them about the behavioral strategies that they need and to help them practice social distancing. Um, we need to address the gaps in the coronavirus relief for immigrant households. Um, we also need to get everyone to complete the census. Only uh, with, with that information, cities and counties and states can do better planning. And most of all, we need reform to address our poverty and in income, uh, income inequalities. Uh, some additional steps that, that are necessary are uh, we need to increase equity in the voting opportunity. How can we truly get a voice and convince our communities that voting can make a difference? We need them to come in and vote. Um, we need to maintain our focus on education all the way from pre-K to college and beyond. We know that our pipeline is broken. We need to be more supportive to encourage all our um, community members to have better uh, education. We need to shift the narrative. Um, the virus is not the enemy and not the person that's infected, but more so this unequal infrastructure that has been created and how can we um, improve that and make it better. We need to dismantle the five ugly drivers of health inequity. And you might ask, well, what are those drivers? One of them is how do we go about reducing structural discrimination? How do we address poverty and disparities in income and wealth accumulation? How do we reduce disparities in opportunities? How do we address the disparities in power? And lastly, how do we leverage governance to truly promote health equity? We need to involve planners in helping us to unlock those health equity policies that are in each of our communities. We need to advance health equity in public transportation so that individuals who are being pushed further and further from cities where they work, that they have you know, reliable transportation to get to their jobs. We need to advance national task force on the coronavirus and health equity. We need to make sure that our vaccines and, um, and protective equipment is available to these individuals that serve their communities. We need to better understand that we have the ability to get involved in health equity. All of us here have a responsibility to do that. And we need to understand that we need to use our voices to speak up for health equity and change. And only until then can we truly have uh, communities where we can all have the right to live uh, healthy. And there's much more that we can do uh, individually. I'd like to encourage you all to visit um, our um, Salud website where we have designed a health equity report card. Uh, and it's easy for you to get there. You can just go to salud. Um, to uh, backslash equity report and enter your county name. This will generate for you a report, uh, a health equity report. And you can get local data with interactive maps uh, and gauges that will help you visualize these health inequities in poverty, housing, transit, and other health equity issues. Uh, and you can compare this to the rest of your state and to your nation. And you can email your health equity report, share it online, or use your social media to help create a better awareness in your community and help uh, encourage a more health equity. We also know that some um, kids witness domestic violence and murder, and some see loved ones hurt in accidents. These kids still have to go to a class or carry on while school is out for the summer or out due to the pandemic. They face the burden of stress and trauma that can interfere with their behavior and grades. And schools often can't see, can't keep their eyes on these children. And fortunately, you can still help these kids. Um, there's a program that we uh, have partnered with that's called Handle with Care Action Packs. The Action Packs helps police, schools, and help mental health care leaders to start uh, the Handle with Care program uh, in which 
police notify the schools that encounter children who have been experienced uh, have been part of a traumatic scene so that schools can provide the appropriate support uh, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner. They can also support kids uh, if the school is out for the summer or closed due to uh, COVID-19. Medical and health experts agree that being active uh, outside is, is crucial to maintain physical and mental health. As long as we keep that six uh, feet of distance between each other uh, during this pandemic. But social distancing is hard when so many of our people are using sidewalks and trails and parks that um, are not necessarily always in, kept in the best um, conditions, uh, but, but that we can help them um, to, to have better access to this. So one concept that we've been working on is where, um, where open streets can help. Right now, many uh, because of less traffic that's going on, less people traveling to and from work, um, we can open up streets, um, and these are um, we can close those streets to traditional traffic and create more outdoor space for people to walk, bike, roll, and stay active and socially distanced during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so look into this more for um, that we have here on our Salud website. Look into this petition to urge your local leaders to close select streets to cars and traffic and to open them up for human activity uh, during this uh, pandemic. Um, I just briefly shared with you some of the importance of communicating uh, this information to our communities, to recognizing that our communities are hurting and that, that there are potential solutions, but it's going to need to take more proactive solutions. It's going to take us all working collectively together to want a better uh, tomorrow for our communities. So let's, let's work together to, tr to create the right decisions, uh, to make the right decisions together, and to create a change in our communities. And I, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Um, as you all know, cancer uh, and COVID um, are not limited to the United States and um, really has been a global issue and continues to be such. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce to you our third presenter, Dr. Uh, Chinangundo, who is an internationally renowned urologist with an expertise in urological oncology. He has been a consultant in the urological surgery at Bart's Health National Health Service Trust in London since 1996, and is an honorary visiting professor at the City University of London. Additionally, he is a co-chair of the Prostate Cancer Advisory Group within the Department of Health in England. and. Uh, not that he would tell you, but I'm going to brag on him a little bit. In 2013, he was awarded the title of Member of the Order of the British Empire, uh, the MBE Award, which is the third highest ranking such award in the British Empire for his dedication uh, for National Health Services. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Chinangundo. Hello. My name is Professor Francis Chinagwundo. I'm a consultant urological surgeon based in London in the United Kingdom. I'm going to talk today about COVID-19 and disparities as it relates to ethnicity, in particular relating to what we term Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities otherwise known as BAME in the United Kingdom. I'm going to talk about this as it affects the BAME communities in general, and in particular, how it has affected the healthcare workforce. I have no disclosures to declare. Part of this, must be due to social determinants, which are related to structural racism. If we look at the English Housing Survey between 2014 and 2017, we find that the 
ethnic minorities are more likely to live in overcrowded conditions. If we turn to the labour force survey from 2018, we see that the ethnic minorities are more likely to live in multi-family households and from the 2011 census more likely to live in deprived neighbourhoods. So we can conclude that the risk of death is higher if you're in a BAME group than if you have white ethnicity. So black males are 4.2 times more likely to die from a COVID-19 related death and black females 4.3 times. And taking into account the other socio-demographic characteristics such as measures of self-reported health and disability and urban versus rural uh, living, your living arrangements, whether you own your house or you're renting, the highest qualification you have, then the risk falls to double if you're black compared to if you're white. The Guardian newspaper pointed out that many healthcare workers have died from COVID-19. And if you just take a look at the picture, you will see that the majority of these are from the BAME communities. The National Health Service employs approximately 1.4 million people, 20% of whom are BAME, full stop. However, if you then look at the proportion who have died from COVID-19, it's approximately 61% of the workforce who have died have been BAME. With doctors, the disparity is even more stark. 44% of doctors are the BAME, and out of the first 18 doctors who died, 16 were from an ethnic minority. The reason for this discrepancy in terms of dying from COVID-19 are unclear. However, on the right are some of the factors that are probably involved. So they are the social determinants of health previously alluded to because most of the healthcare BAME workers do live in areas of deprivation, although that doesn't apply to the doctors. There seems little doubt now that there was a lack of personal protective um, equipment to the hospital staff, whether it was cleaners or porters or doctors or, or nurses. Also, there is uh, much anecdotal evidence to suggest that BAME staff were sent disproportionately to the front line, and by that I mean to work with those known to be infected with the COVID-19 virus. We also know from previous surveys that 29% of BAME workers say that in the past 12 months that they suffered bullying and harassment from their white managers. And I think this leads to a lack of assertiveness. And so if you're not given the right protective equipment and you're asked to do certain duties, you don't feel empowered to say that that is wrong. We can't discount the effect of racism. When it comes to doctors, many of those doctors who have died have been older doctors, that is doctors who have retired and have come back into the National Health Service to lend their help. And we know that age is one of the main risk factors from dying from COVID-19. So we suspect that the age of the doctors has played a part and also perhaps they did not have the appropriate 
protective equipment. By way of background, the National Health Service is free at the point of delivery, so you don't need to be rich to access care. About 10% of the GDP is spent on health. When it comes to cancer, 11.6 billion US dollars equivalent is spent on cancer. 10% of the health activity is conducted in the private sector. If we turn to how cancer diagnoses are arrived at in England, 34% present by what we term the two-week wait referral route. That is to say, if you go and see your doctor, that is your family uh, practitioner, with symptoms which may suggest cancer, for example, blood in the urine, then you will be referred to see a specialist and you have to be seen within two weeks and investigations instituted. So this is a means of trying to achieve early diagnosis and therefore better outcomes. 25% of the cancer diagnoses are arrived at after the general practitioner has made a non-urgent referral. And even then we see that 58% of those diagnoses are at an early stage. However, 21% of cancers present as an emergency, mostly via accident emergency, and most of these tend to be late stage. 6% of cancers are diagnosed through the national screening programs, which include breast screening, colorectal cancer screening, and cervical cancer screening. And the vast majority of these screen detected cancers are early stage. In terms of how the cancer services are set up in the, in the country, there are 62 cancer centers. 52 of these have radiotherapy and two have a proton beam facility. There are mandated times from referral to the uh, cancer diagnosis and then from diagnosis to definitive treatment. So from the time you are referred to secondary care, you have 32 days to arrive at a cancer diagnosis, if indeed you do have cancer, and your definitive treatment, whether by surgery or radiotherapy, has to have commenced within a further 32 days from that. The idea being that from first presenting to your GP with symptoms, you should be treated for whatever cancer you have within two months. Now, there is equal access to healthcare. However, not all communities experience the cancer journey in the same way. Every year, there is a National Cancer Patient Survey, which asks several questions in various domains. Some of the questions, for example, are given on the slide. The data suggests that ethnic minority patients have a lower satisfaction and less positive experiences of care overall. The ethnic minority patients also reported a lower confidence in and less understanding of healthcare professionals, which includes nurse specialists, doctors and ward nurses. I mention this because the cancer treatments have been turned upside down by the COVID pandemic in that cancer services have taken a back seat and the expectation is that this will disproportionately affect the ethnic minorities who even at the best of times report a less good experience than their white counterparts. So what have been the effects of the COVID-19 on cancer care? Firstly, there has been a drop in patients going to see the family doctor with whatever symptoms they may have. So the two-week wait referrals are down by 25%. 
This is because patients are reluctant to go to the GP surgery, they are reluctant to go to hospitals, and also uh, some GPs are reluctant to send the patients to hospitals because it is felt that they are more likely to pick up the virus if they are in hospital. There has been a reduction in the diagnostic capacity because hospitals in the main are all geared up to dealing with the coronavirus. So even if you send a referral request in for an ultrasound scan, it is likely to be rejected for the time being. All the screening programs are paused. Investigations also are paused. So for example, you are unable to refer someone for endoscopy. Clinical trials have ceased recruiting because the staff that would run the trials have been diverted to help on the wards. When it comes to treatments, the surgeries have been delayed. So for example, if you are diagnosed with a prostate cancer and have radical prostatectomy recommended, you have to wait at least three months before you can have your surgery. This is because the hospitals are dealing with the coronavirus uh, cases. The surgeons have been deployed to intensive care and critical care. There is also the feeling that having surgery may put you at increased risk of getting the virus with negative consequences. So those men who are awaiting radical prostatectomy have been put onto hormonal therapy to hold the cancer at bay until the surgery is possible. Those people who are having radiation are having less fractions. Patients who are on chemotherapy regimes are having their regimes uh, altered, so they are receiving uh, different or less chemotherapy. And this is the situation throughout the country. There are very few face-to-face -face consultations. Most of the consultations are by telephone or by video, which is not the ideal way of breaking bad news. The head of the Cancer Research UK writes that the pandemic is having a major impact on patients with cancer and that it is inevitable that these delays to diagnosis and treatments could mean that some cancers will become inoperable. And the feeling is that this will disproportionately affect those from the BAME communities. Because it is recognized that patients are not coming to see their GPs, the NHS has put out various messages by the social media to encourage patients with symptoms to go and see their doctors. It is also recognised that the BAME communities are more likely to pay heed to such messages if these messages are delivered by someone that looks like them. I was therefore asked to record a one minute video for dissemination to encourage. As a cancer specialist, I know how important it is to make an early diagnosis and receive treatment. If you have concerns about your health, for example, you have noticed an abnormal lump or swelling, perhaps in the breast or elsewhere, or abnormal bleeding, perhaps from the urine or in your stool, or persistent pain that's unexplained, this is to encourage you to contact your GP surgery. If you do turn out to have a cancer, then a treatment is possible. That treatment can take various forms, but this needs to be discussed with your clinical team. But the message is, do not ignore symptoms that could be potentially uh, something serious just because of COVID.
what next? There is a Public Health England review into uh, BAME deaths, which is published in June 2020. There is much research going on, both into the epidemiology of COVID-19 and also into various treatments. The hospital services are gearing up for what happens when the pandemic is reduced or over in terms of re-establishing services. There are risk assessments being conducted, particularly for the BAME staff. It is clear that black and minority ethnic groups are being hit harder by the COVID-19 pandemic than others, exacerbating existing inequalities. Further epidemiological research is needed to establish the extent to which this is due to increased rates of infection and why, after being infected, such patients appear to have poorer outcomes. There is also a need for further research on the economic impacts of COVID-19 on black and minority ethnic communities, which may be very long term. If policy responses to COVID-19 are to benefit black and ethnic minority communities as much as others, there is a real need for future studies to consider fundamental society issues, such as the role of racial discrimination and economic disadvantage in how they theorize and measure the impact of COVID-19 on ethnic minority communities. There is also a need for any studies to value insights from ethnic minority community members themselves that researchers reflect the diversity of the communities they are studying and to ensure that black and minority ethnic participants are meaningfully involved in the research effort. And ultimately, any new research should also provide tangible strategies to aid action by local and national system leaders. This is an example of a risk reduction framework. There are several of these and many hospitals have their own. Essentially, there is a scoring system which takes into account your age and your ethnicity, whether you're male or female. Do you have any underlying health conditions? Because we know that obesity will increase your risk of dying from COVID-19 also if you are diabetic or you have pre-existing pulmonary disease or hypertension and certainly comorbidities is one of the possible reasons why BAME patients are more likely to succumb to the virus. So this risk assessment is done by a line manager or by occupational health and depending on where you score, will depend on the advice that's given to you, ranging from carry on as you are to shielding at home. Many services are devising recovery plans. The Royal College of Surgeons has produced a document advising as to considerations before we resume elective services. For example, when it talks about timing, it says there should be a sustained reduction in the rate of new COVID-19 cases for a period of time past the peak to ensure that the necessary staff and the associated facilities are available. Also, the hospitals should be able to test both their staff and uh, patients for the virus. The hospitals should be satisfied that they have adequate personal protective equipment. The other services that are required for surgery need to be in place, such as radiology have to be um, up and working. The anesthetic departments have to be able to be freed up from their ITU work to be able to anesthetize for surgery. I also think it is likely that the private sector, which has worked in hand in hand very much with the National Health Service will continue to provide that support. So what has been happening is that the private hospitals have been undertaking 
the urgent cancer work for the National Health Service, whilst the National Health Service hospitals concentrate on treating COVID patients. I would like to end with this picture from the Daily Telegraph last month to remind us of the toll that COVID-19 has exerted on Black, Asian and minority ethnic health workers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of our outstanding speakers. Um, but before we open up the panel for questions, I'd like to turn my attention to introducing Representative Dolores McQuinn, who currently serves in the Virginia House of Delegates, representing the 70th District. She is the best example of excellence, toughness, and what real commitment to community really means. She has a passion for establishing and building relationships across cultural and racial lines through communications, educations, and simply a can-do philosophy of life. It's also important to note that she's a double survivor, beating both cancer and COVID. And I would like for her just to share a little bit of her story with you. Um, and so the next voice you hear will be that of Representative McQuinn. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, uh, Dr. Wynn. And to um, each of you, I want to certainly, I'm humbled by this opportunity uh, to be here with you this evening um, and just to talk a little bit about my story. Um, I guess I just want to start it off by saying that in terms of COVID-19, um, as my son said, I am a survivor of the two big CCs. Uh, and what I have learned that that's exactly what I am. Uh, my family journey through the COVID uh, virus uh, during the, the pandemic um, in March, um, when my daughter came home uh, from work sick with a disease, uh, the environment that she was in, uh, several of her colleagues was also, uh, had also contracted the disease. And um, what I have learned with this, about this disease, that this disease has no boundaries. It has no respect of a person. Uh, its main objective is to find a living organism, a human being as a host, and to launch its deadly attack. And that's exactly what happened with me and my family. Uh, she came home first, and then after being her, after she contracted the disease, then um, I contracted the disease, and followed by my husband. Um, we all were uh, just violently ill. Um, with the disease and with COVID-19 and um, probably just a little baffled uh, by how it had spread in our household. Um, we uh, did what most individuals were doing, certainly called the doctor to find out, you know, how do we address it? And I guess as we talk about disparities and inequities, but I also found out that even though it was because of probably my position that I was not expected, uh, was not affected as much as some individuals have shared with me, but the difficulty in the community in which I serve was to have access to testing. Um, and I found that many individuals uh, actually across the Commonwealth have shared with me that they have had challenges uh, understanding, knowing, and finding places to be tested. And, um, and so as an elected official, um, again, mine was not trying to um, identify a place to be tested, was not as complicated as from some individuals. I have found out that this experience, this confrontation have exposed so much in our communities. Uh, and I've heard some things as you have discussed today about that. Um, we talk about racism, we talk about the disparity in this country. You know, some are now referring um, to racism as a healthcare crisis. 
And I think the one thing that occurred uh, with this, with COVID-19 is that the exposure of racism, the exposure of systemic uh, and institutional racism has been um, uh, exposed and we realize how prevalent it has been and, and continue to be. Um, we must continue to focus on the disparate impact on minority communities uh, during this healthcare uh, pandemic, as well as other healthcare issues that have always, with the understanding that it has always been a harsher and more deadly on impact on minority communities. I have found out that during this period, again, as my daughter and then myself and then my husband, who were all affected by this, um, I wanted to just, I'm gonna share a little story with you with my, uh, from my six year old granddaughter. Um, and she shared during the period that we were going through this that, um, that um, she loved doing riddles. And so she asked the question, she said, do you know why the coronavirus wants brothers and sisters? And I, of course, wasn't sure where she was going with this, but she said, um, the coronavirus wants brothers and sisters because it wants to spread. And what I have found out, that's exactly what it did in our communities. Uh, just today, I received a phone call by a childhood friend who have some who succumbed to the disease after battling it for two months. Um, I know personally about 25 other individuals, including two families uh, that have died as a result of it. Uh, I'm a Baptist minister, so I realized that, uh, or have found out that um, many clergy across the country have also died and those who, uh, and church members, commun the communities of faith have been affected by this disease. And so again, it, there are no boundaries. Uh, there's no respect of a person as, as it relates to this disease. And this disease will affect um, whomever uh, put, the, uh, put in a position to be affected. Um, I want to say as we continue to talk that since I have been diagnosed, that I have been working diligently to advocate for awareness of the disease within the community. I have gone out to do distribution of PPEs. Uh, I have solicited and asked the governor uh, for them to provide more testing and uh, pushing for compliance for the CDC guidelines and for more accountability. I've also worked to look at the minority businesses to uh, as asking, making certain that they are applying for assistance um, and to provide information assistance for food insecurity as well. I felt it was important for me to make sure that people were aware of how easy this disease can spread and how devastating it can be. As a legislator, I've also been advocate for a collection of data. One thing that I have found when you talk about disparities and inequities, that when I initially went to the governor to ask about data uh, in terms of how the African-American communities was being affected, uh, they did, it was not in completion uh, in terms or nor up to date. And I knew that that was something that was extremely important as we look at this disease. Um, the more, you know, asking for more transparency, uh, certainly the senior citizen communities were, and the um, uh, individuals who live in uh, places for caretaking, many of them were devastated by the disease. And I want to know exactly how many uh, you didn't have to give me the name, but we had a right to know uh, who was being affected by this disease. Virginia also created an equity task force to help deal with the issues in the minority community. Um, as we move forward uh, in, in addressing this, um, special legislation session will take place in August that will address COVID-19 issues. Again, I'm also a breast cancer survivor um, at the age of 36, which was not the typical age, uh, I experienced being a young African-American uh, American woman with this diagnosis. And so I've also uh, have worked since that time for cancer research and worked with a black organization called Sisters Network for education 
and awareness. So it has been um, many, many things that I have had an opportunity to get involved in and to engage in as we look at uh, COVID and cancer. Um, cancer devastated me and my family, uh, but um, I have said COVID-19 had basically ravaged the community at large. Again, the number of individuals that I know personally uh, that has been affected by this disease um, I am, it, it is just hard for me to even comprehend, but it, 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 it speaks to uh, how deadly the disease is, how many people that is affecting. Um, and then finally, you know, we need to look at the surging numbers of COVID-19 cases across the country and analyze how it will impact minority communities. Uh, COVID-19 truly follows the history of racism in this country. Um, and so I know exactly why people are referring to racism as a healthcare crisis, because once again, it really exposed the inequities that we are dealing with across uh, our, the minority community. Um, again, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, it is my, um, my honor, and I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, the panelists have to share with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative McQuinn. Um, I'm going to open up with um, just a couple questions. And um, I'll also uh, let the panel know that if they also, too, have a question or two, um, just, you know, since we it's not every day where you have a panel <laughs> with this much expertise uh, all at one time. So um, I'm excited about this. So, so let me start. Um, we understood. Um, and we're getting a sense of where COVID has left us now. And so my first question is to Dr. Newman. You know, New York was devastated. And in fact, one of the things I know for sure about human beings is we have these um, uh, monumentous moments. For example, back with Katrina, and we said, well, we would never do, you know, we're, we're going to be different. And, we're, and in, in fact, we had the commission uh, on uh, Katrina for uh, disaster preparedness, and we weren't. What's different this time? And what do we need to do to make a difference in your opinion? Thanks, Bob. And thanks so much for moderating this incredible session. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be a part of this. Well, uh, one thing that's so different is how it's impacted on so many aspects of our society, the way we live together, the way we look at each other, now the way we have to interact with masks, social distancing. In my lifetime, I haven't experienced anything quite like this. I did my surgery training through the, uh, the, the AIDS um, the horrors, but that was still nothing like this, very, very different. And, you know, just the way that we are going to be practicing medicine in the future with uh, social distancing and video visits, telehealth, all of that that's with us to, to stay. None of that is going to be going away anytime soon. And so now we're also going to have to change the way we look at um, community health workers, uh, cancer patient navigators, all of those assistants are gonna need to be trained in order to train our patients with using all of these technologies. It, it really is a whole new world. And um, the only, one of the few good things that has come out of this, I think, is the energy that has uh, come hand in hand with exposure, with uh, understanding all of these, uh, or seeing more strongly the disparities, and now the energy that it's um, infused into the uh, the social justice and Black Lives Matter movement. And a, a lot of things have come together to acknowledge the importance of uh, systemic racism, COVID being one. Thank you for that. I, I do have a question for Dr. Ramirez, and you know, communication is important. Um, as we thought about as COVID comes along, and it's you know, same parallels with cancer. Typically, in underserved populations, both rural and urban underserved, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. One example of the early um, examples of that was, um, I think, at the beginning, 
of the COVID crisis, many African Americans believed that there was no way that they would be able to get COVID because this was not something that would affect them. That turned out not obviously to be true. So can you talk about these, the importance of having good solid communication? What have you learned um, through this COVID crisis? And what are those lessons that you'll take forward that will actually not only impact the, the way we communicate about things with COVID, but also cancer? Thank you so much, Dr. Wynn. And again, thank you to all the panelists. Really enjoyed being uh, on this program with all of you. Um, Dr. Wynn, you, you identified a very important question. I think we're all still struggling with sci uh, you know, the communication and the communications of scientific information. Uh, right now at the National Academy of Medicine, we're, we have a committee to look at this because the rates of people believing science are the lowest that they've ever been. And, uh, and so this is kind of, I think, why we're, have, we're seeing this pushback and, and people not wanting to, to you know, use some of their protective um, equipment that we've identified, such as wearing a face mask or you know, practicing your social distancing because they, it's, it, the virus is something they can't see. And so they just, they're, you know, they're wondering and they're questioning science. How do you know? And so this is something that, that you know, as, um, as we just have to continuously be providing as much credible information as we can and debunking any myths and misconceptions that are out there uh, and, and constantly be on the forefront and do them in a culturally relevant way. For example, simple things like, um, and, and I don't know how to, you know, it's like, um, your, the masks, the masks that, you know, uh, the ones that people are, de are um, designing and producing, but they're, they're not washing them and keeping them clean. You know, how do we, we tell folks, it's not just putting the mask on, but making sure you're also practicing hygiene practices with your mask. These kinds of things that are, are really uh, important to us. And I think we're going to have to start getting our messaging out in, in other languages, not only in English, to really reinforce this information and to reinforce the information that everyone is vulnerable, uh, and and especially the young generation, right? Um, because we're seeing that COVID started off as older and predominantly impacting individuals in nursing homes, but we're seeing that um, age decrease now into between your 20s and 40s, uh, you know, we're seeing some of the spikes in COVID. So um, we have to, sh to share with them that everyone is vulnerable and it, that um, also to, to understand that um, it's your role, not only to help you keep yourself safe and your family safe, but why would you want to harm someone else? You know, and how do we communicate that in a way to say that, you know, this is a responsibility that we all have to take on to keep us uh, as safe as possible. So uh, the science is still out. We still have to really test our messages. It'd be nice if we could, you know, do our typical focus groups and so forth. And um, as Dr. Newman said, you know, we're, we're changing our face-to-face our face -face interactions now and going more into looking into digital and getting that input and then, you know, refining it and getting um, the repackaging those messages and sending them out. But most of all, um, I think, because there was kind of a lack of trust from the communities to begin with, this has only made that divide a little wider. And so more than ever, we have to really be reaching out to our communities and getting their input in terms of how do they think they want to be involved and how can we develop better messaging for them? Thank you for that. Um, the next question I have is for Dr. Uh, uh, Chenin Gundo. So, we've been seeing a lot of parallels and some differences between our systems. Um, you're looking across the Atlantic. Are there things that you would um, look at and sort of at, give either to us as advice of how we could have done better with either our cancer care or our COVID care or things that you've learned um, um, to do or not to from folks in the state? Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the main the main difference is the way that, is the way the 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 healthcare is is organised in the states. Um, you know, I, I think it was the first presenter was talking about um, was it district hospitals or county hospitals or uh, or or something like that, where the level of care was perhaps less than than some of the other establishments, and um, we don't kind of have that. We don't have that kind of. Uh, duality of, of of service you know everyone has has equal equal access to to uh, 
the best health care. Um, otherwise, having, otherwise, much of many of the, the issues are the same in terms of you know, what, uh, what is driving the uh, disparities in, uh, in outcomes from, from COVID. Um, the other thing that, that I didn't hear anything about was, was whether healthcare workers ha have died in the same manner that they have died in, in, in the UK. Yes. And, and, and if not, uh, and if not uh, why not? Yes, yes. You know, uh, that's uh, it's interesting data. Um, we'll, we'll circle back to that and ask someone, are we collecting those data? So I was going to, um, there is a question um, that uh, Representative Quinn uh, would like to ask. Th thank you, Dr. Wynn. Um, a question I want that the panelists could share, you know, when initially the communication came out about COVID and about those with underlying conditions would be mostly affected. My question was, with the knowledge of that and looking at the data or looking at science with the understanding that African Americans and Latino population would probably more than likely be most affected by this. Why did they not come out in the very beginning and say uh, that there may be some race of people or population of people that would be affected more than others and they were, and, and uh, those who was in the field would uh, be adamant about getting information to those communities, uh, supporting those communities, doing the testing in the community. Um, it was basically after um, continual discussion and basically demand in some areas to begin to put the information out in those vulnerable communities that it came, you know, the information start going in those directions, but it was lagging behind. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the data, you would know that African Americans and Latino population are affected the most, of the most in terms of health, health care, well, health and diseases. So when they said underlying conditions, it should be a knowledge. Uh, that we would be affected the most by this disease. I'll just open up that. Woo, you keeping it a hundred? I'm just, sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's a great question. I'll open it up to the panel. Anyone can take that question. Well, in the UK, we were certainly slow to uh, appreciate those those points that you've that you've made. We were we were, we were very slow, and. Um, and even when it was recognized, we had a big problem with, with lack of uh, protective um, um, equipment. And so some of the advice was based on what was available, not what was actually the best thing to do to, to, to protect um, ourselves. Wow. Do you think and, that that- and, uh, and, you know, Dr. Newman or Dr. Ramirez, any other follow-up to that? Uh, this, is, this is Amelie. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, here in the U.S., they don't like to react until we have the data. And I think that, that that's when it really kind of opened everybody's eyes, even though, as you well articulated, that we should have known. Uh, but people wanted to see the data first. And then when the data really started showing the disparities and why were the disparities there? Because, you know, our communities are the frontline workers and, and you know, are the frontline in the healthcare industries and all of these different areas that those, you know, those numbers were very, uh, uh, were, were as high as they were and, and finally, you know, shining some light on this issue. Yeah, I agree. It was absolutely predictable that um, uh, minorities, African Americans, Hispanic Latinos would suffer disproportionately. It was definitely predictable, and it is. Um, it's it's tragic that um, action wasn't taken um, uh, accordingly. But there are other things that are potentially predictable where we do have an opportunity to act pro, pro to behave proactively and try to prevent other um, disparities from uh, e evolving into worse um, to public health crises. So that's where uh, Amelie's 19 action points are absolutely critical and uh, making sure that we mobilize the clinical trials communities to get COVID 
treatment vaccine and testing trials to make sure that those are have appropriate representation in terms of patients and making sure that we address the economic fallout from COVID, the fallout in terms of our public hospitals where a lot of our minorities are cared for, making sure that we address the loss of insurance and loss of employment that's disproportionately affected minorities. We, we need to address those uh, issues as well. I'd like to add that th there's one other element to this, and this is about data. We are so used to, uh, I'm going to call this the CSI approach. That is, you know, most of us know that we're very good at the uh, post-mortem autopsies of situations to say, wow, COVID really hit the African-American community. But I'm sort of pushing all of us to sort of think about what if we were to actually have an academically relevant approach to data where just like when we have a, um, you know, a storm coming or a, or a tornado coming, there's an early warning system. How are we using our data that actually, I understand that big data makes us more comfortable because the purity of the data and the stability of the data, but sometimes it gets so pure that it's non-functional. I use the thing that you have useful versus usable. A, a hammer is useful but a hammer is not usable when you're trying to swim. Mm. And so one of the questions I actually have again, and just thinking out loud is how do we actually move data that becomes more functional for our communities so that we're not doing more than just hotspotting and recognizing the problems, but that we're actually getting interventions into those communities as a result of the data. Anyone can answer that question. <laughs> you, you, you've left us speechless. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. Right. It's it's a, an extremely uh, important question, and and again, it, it's um, it it goes back to resources, Dr. Wynn. You know, we we're always stretched so thin. Even like right now, you know, folks are asking us to help at the city level and so forth. And you know, when when we have just a small workforce that is focusing on these issues. And we're already doing other work that we're supposed to be doing. And then these types of um, crises come upon us. We, we just don't have the resources to respond the way we should. But I, I agree with you now with you know artificial intelligence and so much other information coming at us that uh, we should be better prepared. So I, th I think you have an, uh, an excellent idea there. So I have this question is for Representative McQuinn. Yes. Representative McQuinn, we understand that so we understand the work of silos, and this may um, actually also, uh, uh, um, Dr. Um, uh, Shinan Wundo, you may want to add, uh, jump in on this one too, but I'm going to first answer Representative McQuinn. How mm -hmm. do we align the efforts within our government with that of the academic institutions better? Because it seems like we have silos. There are things that ultimately what we understand in academics that need to become policy and policy becomes action. How yeah. could you sort of see us working better together as partners? And then uh, Dr. Um, Chenengwundo, it would be kind of fascinating to hear how policy academics versus government works where you are. Maybe we can learn something. Mm. Mm. Representative McQuinn, right. not to put okay. you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. That's okay, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Wynn. What, what, what I think that based on what is occurring, based on, hold on, I'm sorry. Based on um, the, the limited resources and economically now in terms of the state being stressed, the universities being stressed, the communities being stressed, this is going to force all of the entities to start coming to the same table. Uh, coming to the table and, and basically collaborating in a way that's going to be beneficial to the community, beneficial to government, beneficial to the university. And it's going to be imperative that more than ever, um, because again of, of finite resources, that those entities Ooh. begin to be a little bit more progressive and advancing in helping to address some of the greater challenges of the community and then uh, being able to, I guess, just in many ways, connect, connect those dots uh, for the benefit of, of community, for the benefit of the universities and, uh, or academia, for the benefit of government. 
And so I think that COVID-19, one thing that it has done, unlike cancer, I think we still operate very much in a silo with cancer, but uh, COVID-19 will force some things to occur that has not occurred in the past. So I am confident that you're gonna see a difference uh, now in how we operate, how we um, uh, initiate in terms of uh, legislation and creating policy for, for the benefit of, of all and, and, and particularly for the benefit of the communities. Thank you. Dr. Chenangundo? Yes, I mean, the, the, the government and the policymakers do not suffer from, from lack of uh, good sound scientific advice. Um, I think the, the difficulty comes when, when, when the politics kind of collides with, with, with that advice, mm. such, as, such as we're seeing now in terms of the, the economy dictating um, uh, some actions that perhaps the, the scientists would say, you know, go, go a bit more slowly. So um, it, it's really a, a mindset at the kind of um, uh, government level, department of, of, of health level. So the, the, they have no, no, no lack of, uh, of uh, input. But they may choose to ignore it. Thank you. Here's a question <laughs> that's coming from our audience. Um, uh, and this is a great one. Um, it looks as that there is a lot of issues talking about the social structures um, and talking about the issues around equity. Uh, but this question goes to the heart. I don't know if Dr. Newman or Dr. Ramirez or Dr. Chinwundo wants to take this, but this goes to the heart of how do we know that this isn't just related to differences in um, just, I guess what I'm trying to get, DNA, the difference in just difference of people that African-Americans really are affected by this disproportionately because maybe there is something related to uh, their health or their DNA that makes them more susceptible. And I guess the second part of this is, and what are we doing about it? Mm. You know, genetics is definitely something that needs to be addressed uh, with um, specific diseases where we suspect there to be a hereditary component and breast cancer is one of them. But there are other issues that are all pervasive factors that uh, will address the, the health of an individual no matter what your genetic makeup is, one of those being access to care. You could be the strongest uh, person on the planet, but if you to have a, the heart attack or if you're in a car accident and you don't have access to an ambulance to get you to medical care, you're less likely to survive. So access to care and equitable access to good care has to come first, no matter what. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, we have some questions and I'm trying to figure out how to get to all of these. We may not be able to get to all of these, but um, um, here's an interesting question that I'm going to uh, sort of put to the audience. You know, we've talked about cancer and we've talked about COVID and I, in summarizing this question, it appears that remdesivir certainly works, but does remdesivir or are there other drugs that are being actually tested that may work better in our cancer patients given that our cancer patients already start off immunocompromised? I think that's the essence of this question. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. <laughs> now, I know that there was some trials, I believe with the NIH with uh, tocilumab, but again, I don't, you know, those are early. And so uh, again, I, um, that's, you know, those are early. So Dr. Newman or Dr. Mears, any information on that? Yeah, there are definitely a number of groups that are trying to put together cancer, COVID data sets to, to determine whether there are some long-term consequences of uh, COVID on cancer outcomes, but those studies are in their infancy. There was a very um, uh, provocative uh, publication by uh, Dr. Sharpless um, came out just this week, um, estimating the impact of the COVID shutdown on other aspects of healthcare like screening on uh, death rates from things like breast cancer, colon cancer. And it was uh, pretty shocking with the estimations of excess deaths from those diseases as a consequence of cancer screening hiatus and uh, 
you know, disrupted cancer care during COVID. So uh, we're just now scratching the surface in terms of estimating the impacts of uh, one disease on the other. Thank you for that. Um, I think that- uh, Dr. Wynn? <laughs> yes. Uh, once you get, can I ask a question, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and to the panelists, more than likely, uh, there would be, and science, actually speaking of it, that there would be another deadly disease that's, God forbid, <laughs> that, that we will find ourselves confronted with, uh, that would be even more devastating. How do we start preparing communities um, to, I guess, to address it in terms of health-wise? Uh, how do we build up the stamina of um, African-American communities, vulnerable communities, uh, for in just preparation, uh, whether it's five years, 10 years, or 15 years? What do we do in terms of being proactive to address that? Well, um, certainly in, in, in the UK, there is, there, is much, there is much talk about this. Now, um, we, we know that, um, you know, diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease uh, uh, and so on will, you know, increase your propensity to not do well from, from whatever, you know, future pandemic they may, they may well be. Now, one of the issues is how do we, how do we better get the pop those populations to improve their, their health care? Yes. So obesity is a problem. So how, you know, so how do we message that actually getting your weight down and exercising is a good thing? You know, how do we message out that, that uh, getting your blood pressure under optimal con uh, control, despite some of the side effects, you know, is a good thing to do? You know, how do we message out that that's controlling your, your, your blood sugar level? So I think, I think there is, there is a, a, an issue as to how we, we message in the communities, the fact that looking after things that that they, that they can do something about, maybe in the in the long term um, interests. Yeah. Thank yep. you. I. Uh, <laughs> this is an interesting question. Um, I'm not even quite certain how to put this question. Um, um, okay, so this is going to be for everyone, and uh, I think uh, Representative uh, McQuinn, you may want to jump in on this a little bit. Um, okay. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to phrase this question. Um, this says that we have a National CARES Act, and what has been the visible positive impact on a, either expanding resources or getting more resources for the CARES Act um, and I guess the second part of that question is, um, and at the universities or um, hospital levels, are we sensing a positive benefit from the CARES Act? Um, so I would say, I don't want to put you on the spot at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that could be a question that, uh, you know, but- I, I'm, gonna let, question. I'm gonna let the professionals answer that one. <laughs> I can I can give you an opinion, but anyway, I'll let them them answer, and then uh, maybe I'll come in after that. Okay. <laughs> with the this, this is one of those questions with the few minutes we have left. Mm, okay. Yeah. Right. Dr. Ramirez, Dr. They Newman. talked. To, they actually talked about that today, the CARES Act and um, um, resources going to. I know Morehouse was one of those a university that they were talking about significant yes. dollars going to to do a studies and yeah. help yeah. yeah yep that's right so dr mirrors dr newman do you want to tackle that question with the couple minutes we have left yeah well i can't <laughs> say that i'm an, uh, an expert on distribution of uh the the types of uh compensation that needs to occur to keep our health system healthier and better shape, but I do think that it will be important to, uh, to monitor the distribution of funds from the CARES Act in terms of especially our uh, safety net hospitals to make sure that we keep them uh, viable and, uh, and support them as they deserve. 
This is Amelia. So I support uh, Lisa's comment. You know, we, we really need to make sure that um, our hospital personnel are prepared and they have all the protective equipment they need, but also not just in our metropolitan areas, that we make sure we take care of our rural areas and our borders, you know, and make sure that they have all the resources that they need and that the, the resources are equitably, you know, distributed. And maybe re-looking re at what are going to be the priority groups. If we know that uh, Latinos and African Americans are going to be at greater risk, you know, uh, perhaps that's a different way that we should look at the potential distribution. So um, hopefully we will um, get our leaders to, to look at that a little closer. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, this says, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the vac vaccine um, and in the interim, how close, I guess this one is, how close are we, or is there any knowledge about um, where we are in the status of the vaccine and how that may have a positive impact on our cancer patients who are suffering with cancer? In the context of COVID and cancer, I'm, I'm assuming that that's the question. Any takers? Um, well, I mean, in, in, in the UK, there are uh, the, the vaccines being developed are qu at quite an, an advanced stage. And but I suspect it, it won't be until next year before they're actually ready, ready for uh, rollout. Um, now, whether that will be something that goes worldwide or whether each country will develop their own, you know, is, is, is unclear. But I, I, I anticipates what will happen is that is that um, cancer patients being at high risk of not doing well if they if they get the uh, the, uh, the covid will be will be offered that vaccine perhaps earlier than non-cancer uh, patients i mean that, that's what i would ex that's what i would expect but um, i mean that isn't policy <laughs> that's just what, what i think uh, should happen I got two questions that I know I'm just going to try to squeeze in here. Um, one is, will there be funding for patient navigator networks beyond the pandemic? And could this blueprint be used for cancer education later? I think that's an important question to ask this panel. I know we're running out of time, but if we can keep it real short. I think uh, this is Amelie. I think we're going to have to think of new and innovative ways of, you know, convening groups with our social distancing, you know, uh, since a lot of the interpersonal approaches that we utilized will, will not necessarily be working for us. So I, I really think that we need to explore. Um, but this also um, makes us look at the digital divide, right? You know, some of our schools were facing that where they had to send some remote vans to make sure that, that you know the students could access a wi-fi so that they could access the school so again it's going to take resources for us to um, e equitably be able to distribute our information and then going back to the va vaccine question you know that we have a lot of naysayers out there right in terms of the vaccine will work or not work and what's get, what's it going to take to create the kind of the herd immunity that we're going to need so again convincing uh, individuals that the vaccine will be safe and that that um, for them to you know take it up or go into having given to them is really going to be critical got it and then i think we're gonna actually have one last question um and i think this says that oh this is a great one. Oh, this is a good one how um when you define asians how are you defining asians um, in the context of Southeast Asians, East Asians, how, what's the definition of Asians? <laughs> well, I, I, I can tell you in, when we say Asians in, in the UK, we mean specifically uh, those people from uh, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh and their, um, and their descendants. We don't, we don't include in Asians people from uh, China or from Japan or from the Philippines or from, um, from uh, Malaysia. They, they go into the, the other category. Uh, wow. wow, okay. Okay, I think we have, um, I think literally this is the last question I could fit in and I, I uh, apologize and I'm hoping that maybe what, these are great questions, a lot of them. I'm hoping that we'll bend these questions for the AACR so they can have these questions and maybe do something about it. Um, 
this is a very good question. Will the information about COVID and Latinos increasing in numbers uh, and those who participate in 2020 census, uh, what about the lack of the ability to register the vote? It would seem that this greatly contributes to the lack of coverage and the lack of voting of uh, Latinos will reduce discussions of inequality. So I guess this is an issue about, is there um, an issue in the context that we are doing in addition to getting people to get tested uh, for COVID testing and having PPE, is there a movement with, um, within this to also get people to be more uh, consistent about participating in their communities and one issue is by the vote? This is Amelie. I think what we've seen, you know, that's been so important with Black Lives Matter is that the, at these rallies, they are having individuals that are uh, encouraging folks to vote. And, you know, um, the good thing is that we're seeing communities of color come to these rallies. And uh, so hopefully that we are, you know, reaching the Latino community that they do need to register to vote um, and, and come out and vote. Uh, so that's definitely something that's really important for us. Dr. Wynn, I, I have seen a shift. I've seen, a, I've seen a paradigm shift in people who are now uh, uh, just encouraging, advocating for a change in, you know, in, in, in how w those who are, well, not a change, but ensuring that people will get out to vote. Mm -hmm. um, I think even today there's a primary, you're going to see some changes in Virginia. Um, and so there is certainly a collective effort. Uh, many people at the table from the clergy to Black Lives Matter are uh, talking about how are we going to initiate making certain that we get everyone to the poll. And I think that because of the disparities, because of systemic racism and historically what has happened, you're going to see a change in many things. And so COVID-19 has uh, certainly create a, a, a paradigm shift, but not only has that also, in addition to that, what has happened nationally, what is happening nationally in terms of the situation with the police and, and co black communities or communities of color, I think that you are going to see a big difference in November's election and those individuals who are going to the polls. And so it's an all out call to get the vote out, uh, particularly in November. I want to thank this panel. Uh, it has been outstanding. I also want to thank the folks who um, um, texted all the, I mean, put in all the questions. I wish I could have gotten into them all. Uh, I do want to say thank you for everyone. There's clearly a lot of work to be done in COVID and a lot of work to be done in cancer. Um, um, and uh, we clearly aren't through yet, but we have hope. I think as long as we have on to hope and we have good science and good clinical care, I think we can get a lot done. So with that, um, I would uh, adjourn and sort of say thanks again to everyone. This has been a enlightening panel. So thank you all. Thank you thank so you. much, Dr. Wynn. Thank you. Nice thank meeting you. all of you. Thank you yes, as well. Thank you. Great to be on the panel with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. And have a great AACR.